Hello, everyone. It's David Sonia from the David Sonia podcast. And today's guest, we have Colby Knickerbocker. Colby is an award winning artist who's been doing music for over 14 years. His music has been featured in Spotify editorial playlists. And last year, he grossed over $100,000 just from sync placements. Thank you for coming on the podcast, Colby. How are you doing? I'm doing really well. Thank you, David. I'm actually, I'm actually quite tired. I have two little, little ones. So running like a music career <laughs> with two little ones is, uh, if I'm being honest, is, is tiring. But I'm doing well. I can well. imagine. Yeah, yeah. So obviously, hitting the six-figure mark is a great accomplishment. But it's yeah. not something that usually just happens overnight. Could you speak to some of the hardships and growth you faced as an artist up until getting to that point? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's, that's a great question. It's, um, I mean, I'll, it'll be a bit of a narrative, but the, mm. the overall sort of theme is that I tell people, it's like, I've, I've probably quit music 10, 15 times, like legitimately. Mm. Like this, I'm done. Like after this song, I'm done. I'm tired. Mm. Um, and it seems like, and I was recollecting this with another songwriter the other day, it seems like every time I do that, I get a little carrot. Like the mm. meta things, like I get a little carrot, meaning like, so, you know, back, you know, I was, um, so this is the narrative part. I started writing or doing music professionally in like 2009, I, around there. And I was mostly like producer instrumentalist for another group. And mm. we, we, I, I thought we had good music. And we played for like seven years and we toured around mostly like the West Coast, um, mm -hmm. but it just didn't kick, right? It didn't kick off. And so after like seven years, I'm like, I'm tired of like headlining at midnight and like getting home at like two and mm. just like having like, please buy my CD, like sign up for email. I was just tired of the whole thing. And at that point I was getting older and I was like, I'm tired of being broke. Like I want to date women mm -hmm. and I don't want to have to like coupon my way into the <laughs> dating scene so i was like i'm done i'm gonna get a mm -hmm. job and right before i got a job i was like i'm pretty good i had a, I, my first my daughter was on my first born was on the way and mm -hmm. i was like um right before i quit music i'll write her a song my wife a song and like a few other songs i was mm -hmm. had in my noggin just sort of homegrown home produced and i put that out there Recorded them, put them out there. And the carrot was in this. So like I quit, right? The carrot was is that first single that I released as a solo art, solo artist got on an editorial playlist, Spotify editorial. And I was like, oh my, like it, 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 I've been trying to get on an editorial playlist for years. And suddenly it's like it kicked with my solo project. And I was like, oh, maybe this is like really a thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was like one carrot. And I was like, and then I started, I was in the sync game before that a little bit, but then I was like, I got a daughter now. I don't feel like playing out, you know, touring. So I'm going to lean heavy into sync. And I did lots of research. Um, and back then it was like 2016 Artlist, the company, you know, the library Artlist um, was just starting out. I think it was 2006. Mm -hmm. And I happened to stumble upon them and I was, they were very like makeshift, like, Hey, we're just looking for music. Can you sign up? And I put my catalog in there. Okay. And because I think there was just such a limited catalog, it got featured on a lot of like top like wedding playlist songs, oh, like okay. songs. And so I just racked up. So by the end of the first year that I released this music, got an editorial playlist, and I got my first check from music that was five figures. It was fifteen grand, mm -hmm. and I was like, "Oh man, like maybe oh. I'm good at this. Like maybe my solo work is like better than this group that I was working with. So, so maybe like this is a thing." Mm -hmm. And so I just started leaning heavy into that. Um, uh, and, and I will say like, that's like that, the story of like, you know, you asked for like hardship and, and lessons there, that story of like me finding artless. It wasn't just like, I had like, I just was like, I'll get into sync. And suddenly I found them first. Mm. I'd been in the sync game since like 2010, working with agencies and exclusive agencies, mm. figuring out like what exclusive and non-exclusive is, figuring out like what agencies are good for my music, figuring out like all like there was like six years of like, like going to like LA and meeting with agents and like going to events and all this. And, and at, when I did my solo catalog, I was like, okay, I need to, um, sorry, can we swear on this podcast? Is that okay? That's I fine. Mean, That's perfectly fine. Go I for it. It was like kid friendly. Um, so I was like, I want to get, I need revenue for my music. I'd sunk like thousands of hours into music at this point and not, not mm -hmm. a lot of return. So I just wanted revenue. So I shifted my mindset 
from sync into from doing like um working with an agency exclusively trying to go after those big big placements you know those you know 20 grand 50 grand placements and i was like you know what? i'm gonna do bulk sales and micro sync licensing and there's a few mm-hmm. laps out before that like music bed music mm-hmm. vibe um you know a pond five whatever and i found this new company artlist that was doing sync micro syncs and i was like you know what? i'm gonna generate like whatever 5,000 streams or 5,000 syncs for like five bucks a pop. Mm-hmm. Cool. I just need money. Um, so it was that like, it was a long you know, journey into sync that led me to that first big check of like, mm-hmm. you know, just learning and, and lessons and whatnot. And that was like, yeah, that was the, that was the carrot that kept me going. And then it mm-hmm. gave me fuel and funds to like do another EP for myself, uh, mm-hmm. which, you know, I put with a different agency. Um, and so it just kept me kept me going. Mm. Um, yeah, does that make sense? It does. It does. It does. No, long, thank you for going so deep into answer your question. No, it's amazing. That's perfect. Thank you. Um, actually, to follow up on some of the things that you mentioned, you spoke yeah. about you know being sometimes maybe being in exclusive situations, then maybe working in non exclusive situations. Yeah. In my experience, like I know when I started uh, around like 2016, 2017, yeah. I was I got into supposedly one of like the better exclusive um sync libraries. And oh yeah, what I, library what library was that, if you don't mind me asking? I prefer not to say it because Oh I yeah, no, it's fine. It's fine, man. This. But like um it's just in my experience, I dropped about I put four songs into them. And mm-hmm. from the research and everything, they were supposedly like in the top five libraries. And yeah. over a year, like having my music in their library, nothing had happened from it. Yeah. And Same. at this point in time, I'm also um selling beats, which is actually just licensing as well to artists and even some visual people who like films and so on. Sure. So I was in a scenario where I couldn't use that music that I put exclusively into that library, but I was in a situation where I was getting licensing for myself non exclusively. And like mm-hmm. it was working in that position. I just want to see from your experience, like how has been the exclusive versus non exclusive like journey working with, you know, saying <laughs> That's a great, I'm glad you brought that up because I've had the same experience. And mm-hmm. when I first started off, I was with exclusive agencies and I probably in like four years got like a $500 placement. Oh. I went with Artlist, non-exclusive, being like, I'm going to put this music everywhere. I'm just going to license mm-hmm. it everywhere. And that's when I started generating like 15, 15K checks. I landed like a $20,000 placement with Song Trader, um, mm-hmm. $50,000 non-exclusive, play, uh, non-exclusive placement with Crucial Music. And I don't know what it was, but I was also able to like network and and, and sort of sell my own music. So mm-hmm. to your point, and, and with and with this uh, the EP I released after that first EP as, as solo artist, I went with one of the top um, licensing agencies in Nashville, mm-hmm. and the same thing, man. I've been with them for two years. I just pulled it out like last month because in two years there was nothing. Nothing. I, I mean, I like to speculate and I'd love to hear your thoughts too. I'd love to speculate on like why that is. But I, my best guess is that, you know, with an exclusive agency, uh, it's like you're relying, you're, the bottleneck is like the agent, whoever's pitching your music, whether they mm-hmm. see the right brief, they think of your music. They, so you're, you're reliant on one point of contact. Singular point. To lay, yeah. To like sync your music. Whereas if you're non-exclusive and you're like with a micro sync library, like art list or music, fine music bed, like you got tens of thousands of creators searching mm-hmm. for your music. So mm-hmm. you've got literally tens, maybe even hundreds of thousands of points of contact mm-hmm. for people to be like, yeah, I'll license that for five bucks versus the mm-hmm. one point of contact mm-hmm. who could be like, Oh, I'm feeling in the mood for like Colby's music. Maybe I'll look through some briefs. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I don't know what that is, but that's my, that's my theory. And the data is that with me, for me, with exclusive agencies, mm. I've probably grossed over 10 years, 500 bucks. Non-exclusive agencies, yes. I've grossed over 10 years, 160K. Mm-hmm. And so I just got to go with the data and be like, that's where it that's is. That's where it is. And that, for me, at least, that's where it is. I know. And I also know there's a lot of, like, I have some uh, colleagues who are with, like, position music or resonate, and they crush it. And mm-hmm. I don't know how they do. Mm-hmm. I don't know what the formula is, but they crush it and they're mm-hmm. doing so it can work, but I, I just don't have the data to back that up for me personally. Yeah. I don't know why, but that's a great question. Yeah. I think just because you did ask a little from my side, like, yeah, yeah. Cause 
again, like it could potentially work for some people, maybe more in an outlier situation. It could potentially work, but based on just like, you know, simple business fundamentals, what yep. you're essentially doing is diversification. Yeah, exactly. Essentially, you're putting yourself in multiple positions where you're presenting yep. opportunities to come from multiple places. Totally. If this place isn't working out now, another place can be working. If that totally. place is working, another place can be working. And yep. the more and more you put yourself out into various different scenarios, the more you're protecting yourself from singular risk, idiosyncratic risk of one singular location not doing what you need. Because in that, as you said, like, we don't know if this person who is in charge of this catalog is going to go all the way to support at this our music at that point in time. It's a very risky scenario to be in. So totally. I think that's why the non-exclusive, because I'm more of a proponent for non-exclusive as well. It just yeah. it gives you a little bit more agency and control in like trying to get more maximizing your opportunities. Absolutely. I, I love I love the words you used used great. You used very expensive words. And I love it. The idiosyncratic and the the more agency. I love that because mm -hmm. what I'm doing now with this, I got a new EP like currently in a waterfall release. And what I'm doing now is tr I'm basically I'm pitching directly to ad agencies like the mm -hmm. dense who's the WPPs, the Landor and Fitches, Sachi Sachi, like the guys who are in charge of Ford's brand to create you know, half million dollar commercials and they need music. Mm -hmm. So it's with that agency that I'm like, you know what? I'm going to be, I'm sort of acting as my own agent, not in the fashion mm -hmm. that I get briefs, but I'm like, I'm selling my music. And I love that. And that's why I tell new artists too, whenever I get questions of like exclusive or non-exclusive, I give them like the data, but I'm mostly like, it feels like you have more agency and you're not totally reliant on one, like you said, yeah. one point of contact when you're mm -hmm. non-exclusive. Different libraries can work with you, man, for mm -hmm. sure. For sure. I totally support yeah. that. And even just to add on to like, you know, what you just described, I think the other variable that, you know, benefits your situation is that you have a vast amount of experience doing it. You mm -hmm. understand the lingo, you understand the landscape and all of that takes time and effort into investing into yourself to be able to pitch yourself in those scenarios because mm -hmm. not everyone can just, you know, I'm going to go talk to this ad agency. You have to have a certain level of confidence, totally. understanding. And just that experience, which you've developed for yourself to allow you to give yourself that competitive advantage, which totally. is important. Totally. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. It's, it's interesting because like, I know I was going through your TikToks and you did even mention it about after you have your music head, once you know, you've created the music, you need to put on your business head, which yeah, is, yeah. I can tell that you obviously understand what you're trying to do for yourself, which is also yeah. important. Well, um, it's, mm -hmm. it's, 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 I love that you brought that up because it is like, I feel like it's the Achilles heel of most musicians as they, mm -hmm. and I, I've seen this, like, if you can just, I tell musicians, it's like, if you can write a coherent email that doesn't ramble on, if you can mm -hmm. get back in a timely manner, you can mm -hmm. answer your cell phone when agents call you, you're going to be nine, uh, ahead of the game by like, not, ahead of 90% of the game. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, just 100%. very basic, very basic business like sense, you will be ahead of the game. And it's, it's, um, it's frustrating, not frustrating, but it's, uh, I don't know if it's disheartening for me when I see like musicians who have great music and they just, they can't, I don't know. They don't have that business mind, that left brain or right brain mind that can mm. get them in front of the mm -hmm. you know, their music as a product that they're selling versus mm. intertwined like artwork that they're really mm -hmm. uh, precious of. Uh, yeah. So I, I love that. That's a great point. I do actually have a question that's kind of, you know, towards that do you think that your let's just say your business brain became better optimized while you were a dad because you have more responsibilities so you have to think more critically of how i need to do this to make sure that it works out so i can take care of the people that are dependent on me uh, yeah a hundred percent hundred percent um it, it was more it was less about being optimized as far as like i have to take care of people but more around my time became more precious. Mm -hmm. So in that regard, I had to, I was very analytical and looked at the data, the historical data and looked at the trajectory of where I wanted to go to say like, I need to optimize my time in the most efficient manner. Mm -hmm. And there's a balance there. Like you, you can be too optimized where you're like, there's like no fun, right? You, there's no like free, like, all right, I'm going to like, you know, ran, um, jam for like 15 minutes by myself. Like you can be too optimized, but mm -hmm. what it did was it, it forced me to be like, you know, to, my no became stronger. I guess that's the better way of putting it. Yeah. My no became stronger. So like when there was like, 
hey, can you play at this winery? It's like 50 bucks for four hours. I'd be like, no, thanks. Like, I don't want to and I don't need it. Mm. Or like, why don't you try this? Uh, you know, I'm a new agent or library. And can you submit my music? Or do an exclusive thing here. And I'd be like, nah, because that takes a lot of time for me. And mm. I know like the like a year over year per song, I can get like seven to 10 grand per song over here. So mm. I know just became stronger because yeah. I knew like I got like, 10 hours, 12 hours of working time in the day. And mm. a lot of it can be dedicated to my kids. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to be wasting my time driving here, going here, going to this meeting. I really, mm. it, and it still is today. Like, and, and it fuels like the reason why I do sync so much because it, it's for me, at least the most uh, um, efficient, like passive, not passive, but like efficient way to, uh, to make high amounts of revenue. in my music. Yeah. Yeah. No, I could so, yeah, totally hundred percent being a dad, and I, I and I encourage this of other musicians too. Is like, you know, be open initially and and have you know a bit of play in like your your time and and don't be so you know very um, stringent uh, or or um, how do I say structured. But mm-hmm. at some point, like, learn how to say no because there's so much there's so much stuff that you could be doing. Focus yeah. in on what you want to do mm-hmm. and you know, say yes to all that and be like be sure to say no to stuff that doesn't serve your goal. Right, one hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. Because, like just even add on to what you're saying. It's I think when you're it's almost like an entry level position as an artist. When you come into the game, there are gonna be scenarios where you will potentially have to say yes more because you don't have enough experience or insight and putting yourself in certain positions can help you grow as an individual. And as you get more and more value, you gain more leverage. And that yeah. lets lets you be in a position where you can start saying more no's over time because totally. you developed yourself and made yourself competitive as you evolve. Totally. Oh, that's, and yeah. In that scenario too, it's like, I have the historical data to know, like one of my posts you probably saw with like, um, uh, the c- catch and release, uh, person who came to me was like, we'll buy this license to song you five grand all in. Mm-hmm. And I was like, ah, I've got some history. I've got some knowledge yeah. and experience on this type of licensing. And I know it's worth at least 20 K. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to go back and I'm going to say no to that first offer, but I'm going to politely counter with uh, an offer that I know is this, is the correct value for this song. Yes. And, and like, I think having that knowledge, but also having that, uh, what do I want to say? Like, um, not the experience, but like in your catalog, like they see, like if you are an award-winning songwriter or if your music's been featured in like a Carnival Cruises or Coca-Cola commercial, that kind of adds value to, to your yep. music as well. Knowing... Yeah, being able to leverage that value. I know it's for like new artists who've never been in sync. It's kind of like a useless advice, but like mm-hmm. it's okay to start small. Like you said, it's like it's like okay to feel like it's an entry level mm-hmm. position and move from there. But once you have that experience, start to leverage that data to, to your advantage for negotiating, for knowing mm-hmm. where to place your music and, and all that for sure. And that's the thing. Like it all, it always starts from somewhere. Mm-hmm. Like. When so how it usually works is that as soon as you start to get some you know accolades or dependent regardless of what scale it is that yeah. accolade can let you give you a better position to negotiate for the next accolades and you keep on stacking and stacking and adding more over time is cool. about taking what happens when you can get it understanding yeah. the value of what you have right now so you can use it when you're negotiating in further scenario and keep increasing your value over time. So yeah. like, again, like, as you said, like, once you have leverage to say that I've been in this scenario, a yeah. person can't come and BS you and try to like, you know, play with you and say like, oh, like, oh, no, this is what you should get. You yeah. already have established value because you have association with these brands. So they know that, okay, no, he knows what he's saying. So I can't try and finesse him kind of thing. Yeah. So like, yeah. it really increases your negotiation value and abilities. Totally. But yeah, no, 100%. Yeah, um, I love the piece of that. It's so funny because I had so many questions around this, but you're kind of like flowing into them naturally before I even get to ask them, which is, which is. I love weird. it, dude. We're in the state. We're in the flow. In the flow. <laughs> um, let's see. Okay, here's a question. So yeah. there's, you know, with standard like sync companies and music libraries, is you submit their music if they accept, like they pitch it for you potentially, and if you know you they get a successful play, then you split the profits. In libraries that use a subscription model how is that business structure broken down how do yeah. you compensate artists in that scenario yeah it's generally um 
with I'll, I'll use Artlist as an example, and I think actually these other models like Music Vine, Music Vine have have all started the subs- subscription based model. I think yeah. Artlist sort of um, pioneered it, and it's basically mm-hmm. how they do it. I think it's actually in the terms of the contract. It's like sixty um, percent of their gross revenue forever mm-hmm. for, for the year within Artlist. I think it's sixty percent. I mean, don't quote me on the numbers, but something like a large chunk of their gross revenue is allocated to artist payouts. Mm-hmm. And what they do is they calculate within that, let's say it's a million bucks, mm-hmm. 60% of that 600 grand. And they divide up that 600 grand by the total amount of downloads per that year. Mm-hmm. So if it's 600, let's say it's 600 grand, and then say that's six, um, 600, sorry, yeah, 600,000 downloads. So mm-hmm. that would be $1 per download. Mm-hmm. And then they basically go into your catalog and say, you had 100 downloads, $1 per download, you get $100 mm. for this year. I mean, those, those numbers are, are way off because, you know, it's usually like, you get like, you know, 9,000 downloads and like six, seven, 10 grand, et cetera. But it's basically, yeah, they set aside, the company sets aside a chunk of revenue and depending on, it's basically like a popularity index of your song. Mm. To say, like, mm. if your song was downloaded a lot. It's very popular. You get a larger share of this giant pot of, mm. Of, of money or funds. Now the challenge of that, and, and this is kind of where it's like um, um, the challenge of that, where it becomes like um, uh, interesting mm-hmm. and where I'm at right now is like trying to gauge like, like with our list, it's become so big and there's so many artists mm-hmm. that the cut of that pot is increasingly smaller or you have to get yeah. more downloads to maintain that same amount of, yeah. of So it's interesting. Like right now I'm in the equation of like trying to diversify my, portfolio between different libraries to say mm-hmm. like all right i got four songs here i can put it in this library and trying to suss out like this is a highly popular library or mm-hmm. subscription based model mm-hmm. but there's not a lot of artists in there maybe that's a great place to go because people are paying a lot of money to be there but maybe mm-hmm. the pot is divided up amongst less artists so okay. that's kind of where i'm at right now is like trying mm-hmm. to feel out like where like which which library is going to do best for this music or which which agency um, but yeah, that's generally how it, how it works. I, I would, I would be surprised if those other subscription models had a different, um, mm-hmm. yeah, had a different model. And with like Artlist, for example, do they, do you, does your catalog have to be exclusive with them or do they represent you non-exclusively? With no, I, that, that's a great question. So Artlist is kind of, in a, a, a little bit of a backtrack on that. Artlist feels like it's got this like, not bad boy reputation in the sync world, but like some libraries like specifically do not like your music to be an art list and in their catalog. Yeah. I've had a few, a few libraries say this directly and ex- explicitly. Um, uh, and the reason is, is that um, I think because art list came to the game first and sort of <laughs> undercut everybody. Yeah. Basically like, you know what? It's not going to be 60 bucks a download. It's going to be a subscription based 200 bucks a year. You get unlimited downloads. Take that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so with Artlist, so to answer your question with Artlist, Artlist is very much open, non-exclusive, wherever you want to go. And mm-hmm. I think they might be changing that a little bit. I know they have like some custom licensing, like you can create some exclusive tracks and maybe they're mm-hmm. keeping that a little bit. But Artlist is sort of like the bit, the behemoth at like the, 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 the foundation of the, like the sync, mm-hmm. uh, library where some of these other libraries um they'll want like more than half of your catalog to not be an art list if you're going to be with them or, mm-hmm. or, or they'll they, but they're not not exclusive they just don't want it specifically in yeah because of the which is, which is and uh, i will say this about about art list uh, it's got that reputation and i've always told my other songwriter friends about this i i, I almost want to like I roll my eyes at these other libraries. And the reason is, is not to throw shade on them, but mm. the previous to art list, a musician trying to get revenue from sync, they were, it was a very exclusive club. Does that mm. make sense? It was like, mm. it was like three little libraries, like Marmoset, Music Vine, Music Bed, some agencies, and it was mm. all exclusive. It was like fine dining in mm. a restaurant. You had like hundreds of musicians outside this like double pane glass tapping in being like, can I get some steak? Like I'm really hungry. <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. And they're like, oh, the gatekeepers were like, mm, no, it's not that great. We're all still dining and, 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 and whining in here. The other artists who were in the restaurant were having a great time because they're, they're, they're being fed. Mm-hmm. Artist comes along with like a carnitas food truck and was like, hey, 
I'll give you a burrito, like a local, a, a street taco for your song. Mm. It's not going to be a steak, but it's a street taco. Mm. And they fed thousands of artists, right? Mm. In, the, mm. in this metaphor. And so I look at these other artists who are like, they're all like butthurt about Artless coming along. And I, I, I go like, like tough, like, I, I don't care because I made a lot, a lot of revenue and it kept mm. me going. Artless kept me going. So I don't mm. have a lot mm. of sympathy for these other um you know, artists who are in these other, in this exclusive club and these libraries who are like, mm-hmm. oh, but Artlist ruined the game. It's like, they didn't ruin the game. They ruined the game for you. They mm-hmm. gave tens of thousands of other artists an actual yeah, viable, like, source of revenue. And mm-hmm. that is a good thing in mm-hmm. my book, mm-hmm. right? It's such a fascinating concept. Like, when you really think about, um, I guess, when a business model that's generally the standard changes because of, you know, a company being like, you know, a changer, like switches up the structure and yeah. seeing how the old guard and the new guard, I guess, are at odds. Yeah. Because similar thing can be said with like Beat Stars and any other licensing platform. Whereas before beats were like, you know, 10 grand, 20 grand per beat. And it was oh, like really? left out to a smaller, a smaller, um, you know, a smaller pocket of producers that could be in sure. that position. Then yeah. BeatStar comes in, it democrat democratizes the whole landscape. And yeah. now there's a larger um, portion of artists who can generate income from it. Yeah. Um, it's 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 it always happens every time in various things. And it's always interesting. Mm. I think what's kind of like fascinating right now is seeing because I think the markets are like it's always evolving, things are always shifting. And it's gonna be interesting to observe how I guess people um how people react to like i guess how the markets are evolving because like from my perspective and from what i'm analyzing and seeing everywhere else it looks like the the standard of where beats were at before Mm -hmm. is changing and it looks Mm -hmm. like the market is evolving and i want to see like i'm just interested to see how like i guess because i'm seeing like maybe younger artists now maybe doing like lower price beats and even before the general standard it's going to be interesting to see how when the market reacts to it, how the previous, you know, people react to it as well. And just how everything evolves in general. But yeah, no, yeah. I, it is, it is interesting. And I, I'm seeing that as well. Like, mm-hmm. it, I think this ties in to, to your comment ties in well to like, um, AI generated art. Yep, you know, that's going to be another variable. Right. So mm-hmm. that and I, I, I tell, I think what I, my prediction is that with like, you know, this, it, the access to creating music is so, the the bar the barrier to entry is so, so low, right? It's just like a cheap mm-hmm. laptop, Fruity Loops, Logic, whatever music, uh, Garage Band. You can make music, right? You can throw it out Everything. there, yeah. Um, but I think what is going to happen is the the sort of quality and the artistry of the um, of the music, right? The depth mm-hmm. and sort of like quality, like uh, the difference between like a Kmart pair of jeans and like a Louis Vuitton pair of jeans. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. I think that's going to be the differentiating factor, particularly mm-hmm. when mm-hmm. AI comes out and it's just going to be a flood of mm-hmm. mass, you know, mass produced music beats because mm-hmm. it's gonna be so easy. I think for artists, what's going to be important is, is sort of diversifying and, and sort of um, uh, weighing for lack of a better word, your catalog into like, this is my entry level catalog or mm-hmm. my, my beats catalog. It's like, I got 10, tracks in here beats on this that i'm gonna flood the market with and mm-hmm. then i'm gonna hold back some of these other tracks for like mm-hmm. exclusive use or mm-hmm. like higher end use because i yeah, it's almost like creating a you know false uh supply issues with your music yeah. like yeah. the diamond industry mm-hmm. but i think that that'll be uh that's kind of how i'm viewing it now is like i have mm-hmm. like my catalog that's just everywhere and then i have like some songs I'm like, well, these are exclusive. These aren't everywhere. And so mm-hmm. that creates a, um, uh, yeah, false, uh, supply issue with my music. And it, mm-hmm. I, us, I think will create like more demand, but it, it will be interesting how the market shift. I think, um, mm. yeah, it will be interesting. Say I think even just as a general plan, you're just, it, it's just smart because you're positioning yourself in multiple sectors. It's the same yeah. thing as like, it's also like, um, for example, some producers may do like a custom beat and that's like their high ticket product where they charge a higher price. And they, totally. but they also have beats that are available for a different market. That's more yeah. available, um, cost, you know, effective for like people at a different budget level. It's yeah. just, it's always smart to see 
all the places that you can position yourself with based on your skill sets and the products that you have. Because at that point, like, because you never know which is going to be the one that is the most optimal. At least if you get to test out different things, try different things. One, you prepare yourself if the market shifts towards another area. And two, you can potentially diversify and get like income from different structures. So like, no, it's smart that you're doing that as well too. Yeah, I think, mm. and I think that's, a, I think that's a great point to uh, diversifying. Uh, yeah, being mm. in, I mean, it's the the fun thing about the fun and the challenging thing about music is just that it's such like every what six months, it's like significantly changed <laughs> of how it's working, mm-hmm. right? And so mm. it's hard because you have to keep up. But the yeah. the opportunities there, when things change, things are breaking, and so there's mm-hmm. there's gaps where you can like fill in those needs yeah. of that are changing. So mm-hmm. it's both the challenging part about music and the the thing that helps like is mm-hmm. like the differentiating factor within music that allows like new artists to like rise up. Like with TikTok, imagine like TikTok in 2019, there was really nothing going on, and suddenly like mm-hmm. 20, 21, 22, like you could go viral. You you could have a record deal within a month on this one little platform that no one heard of, you know, four yep. years ago. Um, and so in a year or two, it's already the, the, the landscape is already evolving and changing. That's what I mean. Like I was even I was talking to my my guy like uh, a week ago uh, mm-hmm. for like organic social. He's like, it's all changed, man. Now it's like it's like YouTube Shorts. You got ads coming back. Mm-hmm. YouTube uh, TikTok is like viral down, like long mm-hmm. former content. Mm-hmm. It's always shifting, so it's challenging. Mm-hmm. But that means like you can always stay ahead of the game. You can always there's yeah. always to be like I'm a nudge in on this change. I'm gonna get in on mm-hmm. this change. Um, yeah, yeah, I think that's what keeps the doors open. Hmm. I think that's why, and I know it's not something that every musician wants to hear, but realistically, when you have a good idea of business and how things work, you can sometimes predict where things are going before they even happen, kind of yeah. thing which lets you be in a position to take advantage of the situations that can potentially come to you. So for example, like, um, I'll just give like, like, let's say a year ago, a year ago, or I can't remember. It was even a year ago, two years ago, like three to four months. This is when TikTok was heating up and like Instagram was getting ready to compete with in uh, TikTok and creating like their real structure and like really trying to be a platform that focuses on virality. Yeah. So I remember like I wrote like a post talking about like, you know, that this transition was coming and just, you know take advantage of it when it happens because when you also have experience you also know that these things don't last these yeah. moments of virality like there's always a period where a platform or something is going to give you like you know so much growth then it starts to level off once they've gotten what they want out of it so yeah. like um, i remember at that time i was like just trying to advise as much people to like take advantage of this while it's there because it's not always going to be there you kind of almost have to wait for the next cycle of virality Totally. I think I think that's probably one of the the, the more valuable pieces of advice in the music industry, mm. specifically with with organic social media, mm-hmm. paid ads, etc. I mean, I'm kicking myself because in 2019 I was like, I don't want to be like I, I was like every musician be like, I don't want to be on another be on TikTok, <laughs> another thing, and I I'm kicking myself now. But yeah. the same thing can be said for um for like sync licensing mm-hmm. and parts to and what what I mentioned before is like when I got in with Artlist. I think I was one of the first 100 artists on the platform mm. and that, I, I, that allowed me to ride the wave of artless growth. And now they're like the mm-hmm. biggest library, I think, mm. or they have the biggest platform in the industry. So to, to your point is like to other artists, when you see like something, and it, it, I'd love to get your opinion on like what you see changing, but like when you see something changing, try to get in on it at least a little bit and try to, mm-hmm. you know, try to, um, yeah, shift your strategy and, and thought and try to be dynamic around it. Cause it can mm-hmm. like it, like artless, like it's probably, I think it's harder to get into artless. Now you're not getting as much revenue because there's a lot more artists on there, mm-hmm. but like years ago, like it was, it was good. Like the getting was good. And now it's like, mm, not so much anymore. You got to look for what's, what's the new thing going on. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm. Mm. It's, it's tough. I, I will say I think some general things that are always good to have is rather than depending on virality, you want to focus on like I think three things that are really good that are helpful is one having a decent understanding of ads. Because at that point you're not necessarily focusing on trying to have this blow up moment. It's more so yeah. if you have a certain budget, if you have the right piece of content to market, 
you can kind of predict how much, like, let's just say followers or engagements you're going to get. And at that point, you've set up a foundation for having a predictable business. Yeah. So like, that's the first thing. The second thing is also to try and rather than having quantitative growth, try and have qualitative growth. How much can you build the relationship and value with the people that come into your universe, your ecosystem, focusing on those individual interactions, individual comments, all of those scenarios are like what builds the value with each individual person that, you know, taps into your brand because that relationship, let's just say if you built a strong relationship with one individual person, it increases the conversion rate of the potential business in how they can support you. Like a random person who follows you, but like you, they don't really care about you versus someone who actually appreciates what you're doing. And like, they feel like there's a connection is more likely to financially support you. So like in those scenarios, like, again, so going back to um, having like at least some ad marketing structure. So, you know, that there's something that you can predict and I have an idea of what's coming in. Those people that come in, build a relationship with them. Then ideally also moving, then the third thing is moving people off these platforms have them like on an email list or uh, text line, something that you control the means of communication because you never know when these platforms are going to change the structure. So the more that you have people within your ecosystem that you can always directly contact, the less of a, the less vulnerable you are to the platforms. Yeah. yeah. I I love that. I Mm -hmm. love all, I love, I love the the point number two Mm -hmm. specifically um, and it's, I, I, I usually, um, I do this and I, I tell artists too, is like, do the things that are not scalable. Mm-hmm. And to me that I think, I think you get this is like, when someone follows you, reach out to them. Hey, thanks for the follow. I love that you're mm-hmm. following, uh, you know, here's my latest single or when they comment, Hey, thanks for the comment. Love, like be engaged with them. They see that mm-hmm. because the bigger artists that they follow, I don't know if they ain't got time for it or if it's just too many people messaging them, but like you're not going to get a, a, a you know a, a message back from you know Dre mm-hmm. or uh, you mm-hmm. know, uh, Miley Cyrus or whatever, but they can form that relationship with you and feel like they're part of your your universe. So I love and I love I love just forming those relationships, and it's such an easy way. Like if they came from your ad, like you've got them in your universe. Your work yep. is 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 working. So mm-hmm. keep, make them feel like they're worth, they're valuable to you. Yeah. Which yeah, is, I which is, that. I think what it comes down to, like, it, it, it starts with having the mentality of appreciating the people who appreciate you. Totally. Like, you have to realize that these are like the foundation for how you as an artist are going to move forward. It's not just simply what can I get out of them is what can I create that is beneficial for everyone that's coming into this ecosystem. Totally. And like from there, like, it's 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 funny because like as you said do the things that aren't scalable like once you start to do things like that like your stability becomes so much stronger like it's easier to have a less fear because at least you know you've built something and people who appreciate you like and also like you have the opportunity to also potentially evolve over time because these people you know there's a relationship there's an understanding they have an idea of who you are you may go in a different direction over time. There's so many things that you can evolve, but because you've established a relationship with them, they're more willing and open to potentially see you evolve and stick with you. So like, uh, that's part of the process of building a community. As people always say, it's not just getting followers, it's building an actual community. Totally. And like, I mean, I'm sure you've seen this. I've seen people with hundred thousand followers, mm-hmm. uh, but they couldn't get someone to the show or buy merch because mm-hmm. right? they got the followers, but they don't have that, that, uh, that fan base, that loyal fan, mm-hmm. which, uh, yeah, which I think is, is like, like you said, it's critical for, for musicians growth and mm-hmm. for stability and different sources of revenue. And, yeah. Um, all of it. A hundred percent. hundred percent. No, 100%. Um, just to pivot a little, actually, no, let me, let's stick with sync for a second. Um, obviously I've heard the story of how you got the $20,000 placement with Uber, but yeah. for the listeners, could you tell them how that whole scenario went down? Yeah, totally. Um, it was, uh, so there was a song that I had, uh, or I have still there. It's called the wedding song. Mm-hmm. And, um, I didn't know it at the time. I wasn't trying to be fancy, but I just called it the wedding song. Cause I wrote it for my wife on our wedding. So it's just like the wedding song, but it, it, it ended up being, uh, I put it on the art list 
when they first came out. And it ended up being uh, one of the best, like for me at least, licensed tracks. And I attribute it with hindsight back to it, that title just being good SEO. I didn't mm-hmm. realize it at the time, but it was like when people look for like wedding music or wedding songs, the title of my song is like that. Mm-hmm. So it up. So that song in like from like 2016 to you know, and still it's it's just being licensed, you know, it was thousands of times, tens of thousands of times per year back in the day now, like thousands of times now. Um, and so it's it's kind of everywhere in a lot of music video or wedding mm-hmm. videos. Wedding videographers use it. And um, in one of those videos, uh, a dude, in one of the videos that used one of my songs, a dude used Uber. I think, I forget what, like to get to his wedding or something, but in the little video, um, my song was playing and Uber's in the, you know, Uber's like there's an Uber car or maybe it was in the, in the post. So uh, my guess is, and this is where I, I'm, I'm not sure. My guess is that Uber saw this video. We're like, I want to, we need, we want to use that for our summer ad campaign for like, it was, was it last year? I guess they were just trying to push like Uber's more than just driving. It can do like, you know, flowers or it can do like food and it's trying mm-hmm. to do squash. Um, and so they, they needed to clear it because my music was in this video. They couldn't separate, they couldn't like change out the music because it was already like, it was live. This music, this video was in the wild. I guess they could have like muted all, but there was like, there was a uh, vocals. There was, um, sorry, uh, lyrics, not lyrics. There was, um, dialogue. Um, mm-hmm. so they, mm-hmm. they could have like kiboshed the whole thing and put, but my music was there. So then they sent a, an agency called catch and release, which uh, once they reached out to me, I did some research there. Um, an agency that's exclusively they they clear music for for uh, use in, in videos, and so the lady, the uh, agent at Catch and Release came to me and was like, "Hey, um, we want to use uh, your song uh, from this video in an ad campaign. It's going to be." She gave me all the terms, like it's worldwide, mm-hmm. six month, um, basically, and the usage was like everything but internet, or sorry, everything but um, national TV, which was like social media ads. Uh, mm-hmm business, uh, videos, just all of it. Um, and she was like, buy in for all both sides, master side, and publishing side, uh, all in 5,000. And I was like, the, and so in the, like, as I mentioned on the, on the TikTok, it was like four years ago, I'd been like 5,000 for one, one license. That's amazing. <laughs> but, uh, just that same year and like four months ago, VRBO had licensed a song from me for one of their, um, uh, ad campaigns, mm-hmm. the same terms. It was like six month run, everything but national TV worldwide, mostly going to use on like YouTube ads, whatever. And they, I like, I secured that for 20 K. So mm-hmm. in my noggin, I'm like, Oh, you know what? I just, I just did this like four months ago. Let's do, um, let's see if I can, let's see how, you know, if this, if this will work. So I apply the reach back. I'm like, Hey, that works. Glad, glad that you found the music. Glad that you love it. I was very polite about it. It was sort of mm-hmm. no nonsense. It was like, you know, um, I just licensed this song or I licensed a similar song um, to VRBO for 20K for the same terms. Get uh, Ask the client, you know, if that works for the client, we're good to go. Mm-hmm. Uh, and she came back. And I think I mentioned this video. She came back. It was like, it was like three minutes. She emailed me back. It was like, that's fine. And there was no, and there was no, no back and forth. offer. There was no like, oh, we only have 10K. Can you do like, 10 or we does 15 work. And so I kind of, it was great lesson for me of two things of like, you know, I have that, if you have that leverage and usage, um, from past licensing, like using mm-hmm. to know, like the client who's asking what kind of, if there's a fortune 500 company, mm-hmm. or do they have a budget? And three kind of always ask for more than you think. Uh, mm-hmm. I was like, my buddies were saying like, oh man, five, ask for like 12 or 10, like double it. That's going to be way too much. So I was like, you know mm-hmm. what? I'm going to go for it. And if they, in my head, I'm like, if it's too much, they'll counter offer. Cause if they already yeah. want my video, so they'll counter. So I'm not going to like, like, I'm not going to show my medals like a, a newbie, but mm-hmm. and I'm probably not going to walk away. So I mm-hmm. tried it worked, but that her response time tells me like, yeah, probably the bigger had, I probably could ask for 30, maybe yeah. 40. <laughs> <laughs> but let's learn. I mean, I I feel like I won, but it's like, oh man, I I didn't realize. Like she was like, yeah, it's fine. I'm, I'm they may have a budget like fifty. I don't know. But That's yeah. hilarious. Yeah, it was great. So that was like, I was I love that story, and it's mm-hmm. and it, it, the other reason why I like that story. Do you mind if I keep going? Like this is a long. Keep going. Keep going. The other the other thing I like is because like I tell 
like I tell that story in the TikTok and it feels like I think a lot of, a lot of people look at this and like, oh man, like you just got that sink. Like it almost feels like it just like popped out of nowhere. Mm-hmm. But I, I, to, to, to like, I tell musicians, like, you remember, like I was in sync from like 2010 to like 2006 mm-hmm. or 2016 with exclusive agencies learning that they didn't work. I went with Artlist in 2016, like mm-hmm. to like diversify. I was in Artlist and then from Artlist, uh, they found this video. So this is like, you know, mm-hmm. 13 years of work yep. of me trying to figure out the, the industry, the mm-hmm. game to land this 20 K placement. So mm-hmm. it just pop out of nowhere. Like this is, uh, um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of like pivots and moves and, and legwork that got me a lot of sweat equity, a lot of sweat equity, just a lot of like learning and yeah. not to say it can't happen. I'm sure it could happen to someone like, you know, fresh out, fresh out of the gate. But, uh, sure. it's, it wasn't for me, it was, it was a lot of, uh, a lot of learning and a lot of knowing where to put my music and all that. Like, yeah. you, like, um, I completely understand where you're coming from because it's, I think some people don't understand what it takes one, like, you know, to have that amount of time that's invested so you can even be in the position to even counter and have like you know understanding of it and also the fact that you put yourself in another location where you increase by putting yourself let's just say in art list and your music was being synced multiple times you increase the variable of more visibility by each individual sync as it happened and it just so happened that uber had seen one of the companies that of one of the videography of a wedding that used them and that led to that as well this there's multiple things that have happened up that's led up to this one singular moment and that's yeah. based on you putting things out consistently you positioning yourself testing things trying things out risking yeah. understanding yeah. what it is you're doing trying to be business savvy it's not just it just happened totally led up to that totally mm-hmm. and it almost it comes back to it's reminding me of like the the very first com- question we had about like exclusive versus non-exclusive and mm-hmm. it, it it's reminding me like I'm still a relatively new artist. Like mm-hmm. I make a lot of revenue in sync, but like in the artist field, like as far as like listeners and streams, I'm very fresh. Mm-hmm. And so it's almost like it reminds me of, like as a new artist, it it's probably more beneficial to go non-exclusive because you get that visibility. Like when I started mm-hmm. singing with art list, my streams went up as mm-hmm. well. Like it was mm-hmm. basically like I was being paid to be marketed because all yeah. my music was in these wedding videos where people would message me. They would DM me like, I just heard your music in this YouTube video over here or this like little commercial here or this film or this wedding. And I, mm. I gained a lot of fans mm. that mass visibility. Mm. Plus I was making money from it. So like, yep. I think it's another um, sort of variable for new artists is like, if you're new, like try to just get your music in as many places as possible. Cause that visibility mm. builds on itself, you know? No, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. Yeah. How did it feel getting those messages, like people sharing their special moments around how oh, it's great, that? It's great. I love it. I love mm. it, it's those it, I mentioned before. It's like those carrots uh, throughout mm. my music career. Um, I've I've gotten a few. I, I think I've saved a few of them where I mm. get emails of like I was in a hard place. I listen. Mm. I heard your music and it brought tears. Mm. Like I, it changed me forever. And for me. When I get those, it's so encouraging for me because at least I tell my wife because it, it's a lot of work. Like you know, mm-hmm. you know, music, it's music. It's a lot of late hours. It's a lot of work. And I say mm-hmm. like, I say, honey, I can't explain this because she's not a musician. But I'm like, it's like the closest thing to like real world magic that I know. Mm. Of. Check this out. I can make. I can have a feeling. I can write down some a chord progression with some lyrics. I mm. put it on Spotify, and someone in Japan mm-hmm. a player hears that, mm. and I can affect their biophysiology. Like mm-hmm, I can affect mm-hmm, their. Mm-hmm. Yep. I don't know. I don't know uh, what other thing like cinema can do that. Like, but for me, it's like that's the coolest thing ever. And so when mm. I get those messages, it's like mm. it's very encouraging. It is. Um, it is. It's very encouraging. I'm sure you've gotten that too. With like, yeah. I, I, actually, I see on your Instagram where people are like you've you really helped me out like it, it's just it's a good feeling to know like yeah that you're, you're you're valued someone else looks at your art and your work and goes this mm-hmm. has value and that's kind of yeah. cool you know it's mm-hmm, a cool feeling mm-hmm. it's such an important thing to really also reflect and think about and be grateful for yeah. because like i've experienced that from the music side and also from the education side with the business side and like yeah it goes back to what you're saying, the things that aren't scalable per se, because rather than focusing on the total number, you're reflecting on the value that, that you added to that one individual person, 
how Dude. you essentially, depending on how they took the song or whatever, like it, it affected their life in some way in the direction in which they're going. So it's, I do, I get what you, I get what you mean when you say it feels like magical, like you're doing yeah. something, it has meaning. You're it, having, it, having a, a, an amazing impact. I think that's, mm -hmm. it, it's that, what you just said, and I'm glad you mm -hmm. said it, because it's that, I have to remind myself when it's like, like, what was it? Oh, two days ago, mm -hmm. I was reaching out to an agent or a library and they're, they're like, mm, we, we're not going to use your music right now. And I was mm -hmm. so bummed because I was like, I really wanted this library to use my music. And mm -hmm. I was just feeling down. I was like, this, this sucks, man. I mm -hmm. put so much time and energy and money into this, these songs and they don't want to use it. And uh, you reminding me now that it's like when we can affect like the non-revenue, the non-business side, just the mm -hmm. art, when it affects humanity, it's such a good feeling because it is, you can affect the person. And for me, like that knock on effect of what you mm -hmm. had on their life can trickle down. Like if you, uh, I don't know, uplifted a, 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 a auntie's mood for the day, maybe she was teaching her kids and it uplifted mm -hmm. their kids. And then like, do you know what I mean? Like it has, it's just such a, 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 a beautiful effect mm -hmm. that is exponential that your music can impact the world for good. And that to me is like one of the reasons why I got into music. I was like, I want to do something good with my life. 100%. Uh, the, the, I love making money from it too. Like no, no lie. Like I love it. Um, mm -hmm. It's also it's mostly because I love doing it, and I love doing it because it's mm -hmm. it's such a it's a good feeling for me. Mm -hmm. right? One hundred percent. I think when if you can just sit down and think about those moments, those will always be your anchor during yeah. the rough periods of music. Because there's always going to be rough periods. There's always going to be tough yeah. parts. Yeah, yeah. So like being reflective and thinking about those moments of you essentially created something out of nothing. Yeah. And someone in the world could, it could literally, like you said, Japan, like I have this one person who bought one of my beats from Japan. Like I've never yeah. been there. I love Japan. I would love to go there one day. But like yeah. the fact how far your music can travel and yeah. how it can touch a person's, I guess, soul is, again, it's a valuable thing. But yeah, 100%. Totally. Yeah, I love wow. it. It's, it's a great feeling. Mm -hmm. Okay. I had another question for you. So nine years ago, you released a track called Little White. Yeah. And that's a long time to evolve as an artist. Mm. And over that period, your relation with your older music can change. Yeah. When you listen to it, do you cringe because you feel you're a better artist, even though others may look? <laughs> or do you look back with fondness because it represents a timepiece of a previous version of yourself? That's a great question. It's, it's so interesting that you pick that track. Um, mm. Uh, you probably, uh, I don't know, I mean, you're spot on with it. I, it's a, it's, um, I think it's like, it's a mix of both. If I'm being honest with myself, mm -hmm. it's a, it's a mix of like, that was a cool time. Like why I had, was working with those bandmates and some memory, you know, it's a sonic memory in my head of like what I was doing. And I listened to the lyrics and I'm like, man, these are not great lyrics. <laughs> or like, <laughs> I could have done a lot better with like, oh, I should have done like a lift there. Or like, maybe I could have mm -hmm. done something else with the harmonies. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a mix for me. Mm -hmm. I will say it's, a, it's not a great thing to do to be mm -hmm. like, um, uh, you know, to look back at your music and go, oh, I should have done better. Because mm -hmm. what I have is, is like, it's a, it was a moment in time. You do your best, you mm -hmm. move on you do better next time. But yeah. Yeah. I look back and I'm like, there's a little bit of cringe. I do. <laughs> and I guess that's a good thing. I mean, not a good thing, but like me yeah. as an artist now, mm -hmm. I really, I really dig the art that I'm doing now. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I guess the growth that I see in the difference of the previous music and now it's, it's wider mm -hmm. uh, for, for better and for worse. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I just, it's like, I'm really digging. And I'm sure 10 years from now, I'll look back at the art that I'm making now and go, oof. Wow. Yeah. 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 I guess it's, but I also guess then it's like a good, it's a good indicator of like how mm -hmm. far we've grown as artists. If we look back and go, wow, mm -hmm. that I really didn't know what I was doing with that drum sound or mm -hmm. like those vocals are really off. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you can recognize that now and that shows that there's growth. 100%. Yeah, for sure. That's a great question, man. Yeah. I think it's something I go through sometimes where like I listen to some of my older stuff. I'm like, oh, you made that. That's amazing. And sometimes I'm listening, I'm like, uh, like, I don't know how I feel about that. But so it's yeah. funny because sometimes you're, emotions can change around it at different time points because yeah. there are times maybe where you realize how quote unquote this was not as good then at yeah. times where you're just impressed with your level of ability at that point in time when like you did that it's just like it's it's yeah. fascinating it's like you're getting to watch yourself and yeah i think a past version of yourself and i will say too like mm. i'm probably a good point like a lot of the my previous material was self-produced so when i look 
when I listen back mm-hmm. to some stuff that I, I self produced, I'm like, I, 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 I go, I, to my, say to myself, I'm like, I could never do that today because I don't have the energy or mm-hmm. I don't even know how I did that. Yep. And you know what I mean? It's like this, like, um, uh, like almost like respect to like the previous version. Yeah. Man, you did this out of like nothing and like, yeah. 500 bucks worth of gear with no mm. knowledge, just kind of like slapped it together. And it sounds decent. Like, well yeah. done. Yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, is there's that aspect too of like, mm. well, it was pretty cool. I wouldn't do it again. Cause I was a lot of work. <laughs> I'm tired even looking at thinking about the whole thing, but yeah, yeah. for sure. Okay. Um, now for the final question. Yeah. Actually, no, before this, I did also want to ask how did the verbo um, placement come about? Great question. Um, the verbal placement. And then uh, there was another placement too, the last year that pushed me over the 6K mark with uh, Crucial uh, crucial Music, which I'm happy to talk mm-hmm. about as well. But Verbo, that was through a, a, a platform called Song Trader. So oh, okay, Song, okay. You know, I'm sure you know Song Trader. It's a self-service yeah. platform. I was in there as like one of the first, like when I was first getting to sync, I was like looking up like best places to put your music. And Song mm-hmm. Trader was one of those things. So I just threw it up there. Uh, I honestly, before that, I probably get 20 bucks every six months from song trader, just like, mm-hmm. like, you know, overhead business radio mm-hmm. or something like that. So I had, I had written them off as like, maybe they just, they just not doing anything yeah. well, worthwhile. I honestly, I have a little spreadsheet and it's like a little yellow tab next to it being like, maybe not send music here. Mm-hmm. Um, but then like January of last year. Uh, I got, it was a great, it's a great story too. Cause I woke up, I was, uh, I was on vacation at my mom's house with my kids and mm-hmm. I woke up and there's an email that said, your song's been licensed from song trade. And I get those a lot, but it's like $15 for like a photographer. Mm-hmm. So I opened up the email and it was, um, it said 20 K 20,000 <laughs> USD. And I was like, this has gotta be wrong. This is wrong, wrong. wrong. <laughs> So I, I shut down the email. I go have breakfast and I called my bandmate who I wrote the song with. And I was like, Hey man, did you get that email? He's like, yeah. And I was like, what's up? Like what, what happened? He's like, I don't know, man, we should check it out. So I emailed the lady at song or the person at song trade. And I was like, Hey, this is saying like 20 K USD. Um, I'm guessing there was like a, a ch- currency exchange issue. Maybe it was in mm-hmm. like Indian ruples, which is mm-hmm. like 10 bucks or whatever. Yeah. Um, she's like, no, it's 20,000. And I was like, I was floored because at, at that time, that that was the biggest check I had ever received. Yeah. In one placement. Like, I was mm-hmm. like, oh, my God, there's there's, there's money. And so, um, yeah, it came through and, you know, we got a big chunk of change and we were celebrating. I went down to his house. We went out to dinner, put mm-hmm. on the business card. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it sort of – the, the cool thing about that placement, it, it shifted my mentality because mm-hmm. I've been struggling a lot, you know, revenue-wise with music. Yeah. My mentality to be like – no, there is money, a lot of money in music. You just mm-hmm. got to know where, where like the money's coming down. Mm-hmm. Like you got to know where to put your bucket. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's a lot of money. And that's kind of where I'm at now is like realizing that, you know, advertisements, uh, ad agencies, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars every year in ads and they're mm-hmm. always music. And an ad agency, uh, a Fortune 500 company, a Nike, uh, Apple, mm-hmm. if they license your music for a commercial, like 100K, 150K up front is pretty standard. Like, mm-hmm. like there's just so much money in big business. So if you can get your music in front of like some mm-hmm. of these big businesses where they're doing advertising or mm-hmm. setting up a, like a, a sonic brand with your song, like, mm-hmm. man, no there's, there's, there's a lot of money in music. That placement showed me like, no, there's a lot of money in music. You just gotta, uh, you just gotta know kind of where to put your bucket. I'm still trying to figure that out, but um, yeah, it was cool. Just, just to add on to that. Like I have this one follower. Um, oh, I wish I could remember her name right now, but um, essentially she does uh, essentially high ticket performances for like companies as well too, where she does performances yeah. for companies. Yeah, and yeah. as you said, like their companies, they have relatively a higher budget, a bigger budget. And she can do like, I think she said like maybe one to three K performance. And it's yeah. not like she's some like super big artist. She's just a professional. She yeah. does good music and she knows how to, I guess, communicate her value in those scenarios. Totally. And I think that's the thing a lot of people need to get about music is that there is money to be made. You just have to really do the work to position yourself to be that person in that, you know, scenario that can capitalize on that. Totally. So like, there's always something to be done. 
for sure. Totally. And I've heard on that same note, I've heard stories of um, people doing private corporate gigs for like Microsoft or mm-hmm. uh, oh, yeah. oh, Daddy, when they'll, they'll pay them like 20K, 15K yeah. for like for their group to play like three, four hours. Mm-hmm. Because I mean, these are giant companies that are spending, yep. I don't know, it's 20 million, 50 million on marketing every year. And they're just like, mm-hmm. yeah, whatever, 50, 15K is, there's mm-hmm. nothing. So there's totally, there's, there's, mm. there's, there's mm. money to be made. It's just like, I tell musicians, it's like, it's a lot of networking, man. You just got to yeah. have that personal, like I said, what we said before, like the things that aren't scalable is really what drives the sync agency. Like I have yeah. relationships with agents and libraries now, reps at libraries where I can reach out to them and be like, Hey, I got this new song. What do you think? Can you put it mm. in your library? Awesome. Can you put on a playlist for me? Cool. Thank you. Mm. Um, but that's, that's like for me, like going to like sync conferences and, mm. and reaching out to people. And so mm-hmm. it's all those relationships that really, yeah. I think help a lot, right? Because you're building trust as well, too. Yeah, totally. For totally. Way, like I've seen a lot of people like um, people can lose their jobs if someone gives them like supervisors. People can lose their job if someone gives like the wrong information about like what they have the rights to with the music. Like yes. um, I've seen like stories of agents Absolutely. and, stuff, like, and people just like, oh, like you said you had the rights, but you didn't. And now I'm getting like sued by this other people because of that. So like these intangibles building trust and letting people know that i won't screw you over because i treat myself as a professional and i understand the value of what you're doing and i don't want to mess things up for you so that's like, it yeah I, i've i've spoken to that um uh, in addition to like there's like responding to business emails in a timely manner like that whole mm-hmm. uh, yeah it's showing a hundred percent it's showing that the agents the libraries the agencies that you are a reliable service yep. that lie on right yeah. that they can reach out to you in a crunch and mm-hmm. be like i need this licensed i need a song like this licensed mm-hmm. within the next 20 minutes because sometimes mm-hmm. it happens as quick as that with like i gotta mm-hmm. get back to client by the end of the hour yeah are you clear to use this can you use this can you send me something and if you can mm-hmm. do that they're like oh you know david reach out to him because he's got his act together yep. versus reach out to someone else who like doesn't get back or doesn't have mm-hmm. the clearances or doesn't have the split sheets ready mm-hmm. or like a one-stop clearance contract you know all that totally it's it's building it's totally building that trust to to know that your music your agent or your um you know your label essentially like your your individual uh, label as a musician is rely you can be relied upon to deliver yeah. on time a good product that's clear for use like boom yeah, totally 100 percent. yeah all right now for the final question as yeah. i already mentioned you are also a dad and a husband yeah. How do you balance your music with your other responsibilities? That's a great question, man. It's a great question. It's a, a and um, yeah, great question. And to be honest, I'm still, I'm working. I'm. It's a work in progress for me mm. to to, mm-hmm. to do that. Mm. Um, I, I guess, and it's a great. I'm glad you asked because uh, you know, ultimately, my kids and my wife come first. Mm-hmm. Uh, like my wife knows I love music, um, but if my kids like having a meltdown or if they haven't been fed dinner, or my wife needs my support, I put my music on all. And that's just that's just me. I'm not saying that's right for everyone else, but it's mm-hmm. they come first. I'm I'm lucky enough to have a I have a I have a nine to five job to like support you know mm-hmm. just my my basic my bills and everything. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm lucky enough to have a, a a day job and a wife that is flexible enough. Um, to um, to allow that, mm-hmm. to allow so sorry sorry to allow me to 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 do music um, when I need to. So mm-hmm. like tangibly, what that looks like is like, hey, hun, I got like a songwriting retreat or like a conference in LA next weekend. Would you mind if I went? She's totally supportive. Mm-hmm. But that's you know part of part of my job in that is like I'm gonna do the grocery shopping. I'm gonna get like some meals prepped for you. I'm gonna make sure you you are supported when I'm gone mm-hmm. um, so that so mm-hmm. that it's basically not like my whole intention around this. And I've told my wife, this is like, I want you to think about my music and I want you to get a good feeling. Mm-hmm. And what that means for me is like, when I go do music, you're supported when I get sync revenue for, so whenever I get a revenue piece, I set aside like 10%, 15% for family stuff. Mm-hmm. So I take my kids and her on vacation. Mm-hmm. I'll, I got her like this last year, I got her a nice, like I redid her engagement ring. Cause she really wanted like, and mm. redone. Like I, I treat her because she's part of that support system that allowed me to do what I've done mm. and give me time to do this. So mm. 
Yeah, it's, that's part of my equation is like, I want her, when she thinks about my music, she goes, yeah, that's, mm-hmm. yeah, go, go there and make some extra cash. Or yes, I feel supported. Go have fun mm-hmm. because it's not like this giant drain on the family. Um, yeah, that's good. So that's like the, the tangibles. Like as far as artistically, I tell my friends this, like who are new dads, who are musicians, who are like, I think the standard is like, oh, I just became a dad. My, my fun and my creativity are going to end, right? Mm-hmm. I, think that's the, I think that's the idea most people, most new dads have is if they're musicians, they're like, it's like no more touring and uh, I won't be able to write music. And what I tell them is that like, man, that is a, that's, an, that's a way to go. Like you can think that in my experience though, when I have kids, like the depth of my artistry is so much richer because mm. I have, because I have a, a relationship. Like I don't have to try very hard to reach out to, as a songwriter to, for new material mm. kids every day, they have something that they bring to me. And it's so deep. Mm. Like mm. my feelings for them, my feelings for my family, my wife are just so deep that it's like the material, like the ability to write is so easy now because I have kids. Like I, I all the all material, I don't know what I would do if I didn't have my kids, like as far as material, like I, mm. I don't be writing about like, I don't know, going to the beach and surfing or something. I have no idea. <laughs> um, but like, it's, it's a gift if, you choose to have it as a musician. Like your kids can be a gift. They can, they'll strengthen your no, right? So mm-hmm. you just say like, no, I, I want to spend time with my kids. No thanks to that. No thanks to that. They, they fuel your artistry with the, the, what they show you, how they live life, the, like the depth of the emotion that they bring to you. Mm-hmm. And they'll make you, I think, a better artist because you'll be just more dedicated to the craft because you have limited time and you've got this well of a emotion right at your fingertips. Mm-hmm. Um, did that did I answer your question? It was did, that, it did. No, that was a great answer. Yeah. I never asked you, are do you have kids? Are you are you married? No, 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 I don't have kids yet, no. Yeah. Yeah. But um it's still a good question to ask. I'm not in a position where I'm a father or a husband. But I do think it's a good question to ask for people, especially for younger people, like how to one potentially see yourself down the line if you do end up in that position. Yeah. Because we all get older, maybe that's something we may want to do at some point in time. Yeah. Um, and also just having someone speak candidly on that experience doing it, because again, that could be a configuration in someone else's life. So I thought it'd be a good question to get that perspective. I'm sorry. It's a great question too. And Mm -hmm. I think the thing that I'm realizing now, when I was single musician, Mm -hmm. I wanted fame and tons of streams and headlining acts and, you know, stadiums, Mm -hmm. auditoriums filled. Now as a dad musician, I'm totally happy just making music and spending time with my kids. Do you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like my, my priorities have changed drastically. And I think to some young musicians, they might look at, hear me and say that and go, ah, oh, that, that'll never be me. But it's like, <laughs> it's what makes me happy. Right. And yeah. like keep me happy. And I don't care about anything else. Really. It's mm-hmm. like, I don't care if I get a, a pack of stadium anymore. That'd be cool. But ultimately if it means like, I won't have a relationship with my kids, it's like, it's not worth it to me. Mm. My kids make me happy. So my priorities have like 180 shift. And mm. yeah, I think it's just, I think if you have kids and your husband, don't think immediately that your creativity or your music, musician life mm. is all. It's, mm. it, it'll definitely reprioritize some things, but you, you can use it as a gift in your, in your craft and your industry. Honestly, honestly, there's so many parents who I think follow my Instagram account and like, I see them constantly always still being at it. Like I can see like, like you, how that experience is for them. So uh, yeah. I believe it for sure. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, um, Kobe, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. This was an amazing conversation. Um, did you have anything you want to shout out or, you know, maybe mention your social media? Oh, yeah, that's a great question. Also, thank you, David, for having me. I feel honored that this is, you know, we're breaking, breaking the ice here with the podcast with me. <laughs> Truly, um, I love sending people to your account because you have a wealth of knowledge and totally, um, yeah, thank you for having me. It's, it was an absolute pleasure. I love to talk and shop with other no um, worries. Um, and yeah, uh, Colby Knickerbocker. You can follow me. Uh, you know, just it's Colby Knickerbocker. Um, that's my that's my artist name. Instagram handle, TikTok. I got new music coming out. You know, um, follow me on TikTok. Probably on Instagram is where I'm most active. But um, yeah, mm-hmm. otherwise it was it was a uh, it was a it was a pleasure to be here, David. Thanks for having me. Also, and just one thing, let people know, like, you know, the kind of music that you make, maybe for other artists who are in a similar yeah. genre. They can... Yeah, great question. Yeah, I'm I'm mostly like Americana, singer, songwriter, soulful folk, indie folk. So it's like acoustically driven stuff. But mm-hmm. yeah, very, I think it's very, 
I think I write very passionately, very um, emotive sort of lyrics, but yeah, it's mm. also like soulful Americana, mm. I'd say. Okay. Good okay. question. All right, Colby. Again, great conversation. Hopefully, you know, we'll be in touch. We're already on each other on Instagram, but all right, I will let you go. And thank you again for coming on. Thank you. Yeah, it was great talking to you, David. All right, great talking, Colby. Take care, okay? Yeah, you too, man. All right. Bye-bye. Cheers.